Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Neil Hare from the class of uh, 1991, and we have a very special panel today for everybody uh, with several of my classmates. Uh, we're calling it 30 Years from the Hill uh, Industry Insights. Kind of hard to believe it's been 30 years for all of us, but uh, there it is. I hope everyone's having a good virtual uh, reunion week uh, and participating in the activities. Uh, hopefully, we'll be in person again uh very very soon uh Tufts wants you to know if you want to look at the link for more um reunion info it's go.tufts.edu slash reunion programming i think there's only a couple of days left but if you want to check that out uh, please do so um so today we're going to talk to uh, th three of my classmates as i said who uh are leaders in each one of their fields and uh hear about their personal journeys from Tufts and uh, how they got to where they are today and then ask them some questions about uh, their particular fields. Um, very fortunate to have them. We have uh, Dr. Lara Obler, who is an interventional, interventional cardiologist at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. And she's also been a very successful entrepreneur, uh, founded and, and successfully launched a couple of companies in the uh, health and wellness space that she'll be telling us about. Uh, then we have Andrew Howe, who is a partner in Monument Policy Group, which is one of the top lobbying firms in Washington, D.C. And Chris Stone, who uh, is the executive sports editor at the L.A. Times um, and also spent a lot, a big part of his career at Sports Illustrated, one of the senior leaders there. So uh, we'll be covering uh, three top areas, health and Washington politics and sports and journalism. So it'll be a, a great conversation. I'll, I'll be doing most of, to most of the questions, but we'll be monitoring the chat. If you want to uh, put a question in the chat, we'll take a look at that. And if we want to get crazy, we'll actually just open it up for questioning and people can chime in, but uh, probably won't do that. Uh, anyway, so I'm, uh, as I said, I'm Neil Hare. I'm, I'm also based in Washington, DC with Andrew. Um, I run a uh, public relations and public affairs firm called Global Vision Communications, which I've run for 16 years. And I also practice law. I'm affiliated with a law firm called McCarthy Wilson here in DC and uh, try to follow my passion uh, with writing. I'm a regular contributor to Forbes magazine on small business issues. And I do some creative writing. I have a couple of novels and two plays I wrote recently that I'm, I'm uh, hoping to produce very, very soon. Uh, but my most important and dip, most difficult job is uh, being a parent. I have three kids, uh, 16, 15, and 13. And my oldest is uh, looking at colleges right now, uh, like many of you probably are doing or have done. And Tufts is definitely on the list. And um, you, know, you look at it and you look at the, the price tag of these colleges today, and it's just mind blowing. Uh, you know, I'm contemplating eating ramen noodles in my retirement if I if I ever do retire. Um, so you do ask yourself if it's worth it. You know, for me, the answer is 100% uh, yes. And it's because uh, the education was great, but it's really for me, the people that I got to know uh, in Tufts and have spent, you know, life, lifetime friendships with them and looking at all the other people I've seen from my class and others, and just everybody's been a leader leader in their communities in their particular fields and um, just great people, really awesome people. And, and I think that's worth it. And the three people that are with me today are some of my closest friends and um, just have been a very important part of my life. So I think that is, uh, I think that's what Tufts is all about and why we love being with this community. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to kick it to each one of our panel to kind of tell about, tell their story and uh, then we'll go from there. So Laura, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you, Neil, for setting this up and great introduction. Um, I can't believe it's 30 years either. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, I also have three children, 16, 15, and 12. So pretty much the same as, <laughs> same as Neil. Um, and we're also looking at colleges. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have already gone through this process, but it's not so fun. Um, anyway, I uh, also got a great education at Tufts. I went there knowing I wanted to be a doctor, but I was actually a math major um, because that was my passion and I really loved math. And um, I was really glad that I was able to, to kind of do both of those things. 
So my lifelong dream was to be an interventional cardiologist, which is what I am. Um, uh, the other part of my dream was to work with my father, which I was really lucky to do for four years. Um, unfortunately, he's passed away, but it was an amazing four years um, working with my father. So I never planned on doing anything other than being a doctor because it's a, you know, a pretty big job and I, I really love it and it's very fulfilling and gratifying, but my career kind of uh, didn't change, but I got I added to it because when I was about 35 years old, I decided it was time that I have a baby. I was a partner in a private practice and everything was going well and I was married and I was ready to have a baby. And I thought I was just gonna get pregnant immediately. And, and as many of you know, that never works that way. Um, and after a few months of trying, I started getting very nervous and I started reading everything I could um, about getting pregnant. I'd already knew all of the medical reasons and medical ways to get pregnant, but I started reading crazy books. One was called How to Get Pregnant Fast. And it, it was, I couldn't believe I was reading this book as a doctor. It was like, have sex with the lights on and run around and go, woo. I mean, it was so stupid, <laughs> but I read it because I thought, what do I have to lose? I was so desperate. So one of the chapters talked about taking cough syrup before you, um, well, before you ovulate. And the thought behind that was just like the lungs have thick secretions, there are secretions that the sperm has to swim to to get to the egg. And if you could thin those out a little bit, the sperm would have an easier time getting to the egg. And I thought, okay, why not? You know, what do I have to lose? I went out and bought some Robitussin. Um, that month I had a, a meeting with an infertility specialist and my husband, and we we're sitting there and the guy was like, you need to start these medications. I want to do this procedure, you know, all of these things. I said, whatever, bring it on, do whatever you need to do. I want a baby. As we're sitting there, the nurse walks in, she said, stop everything. You're pregnant. And I said, I am, I can't believe it. I've been trying for six months. And he said, I said, you know, I did something differently this month. And he said, did, did you take cough syrup? And I said, yes, he goes, that's why you're pregnant. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm 35 years old. I've been trying to get pregnant. I'm in an infertility specialist office and no one ever told me this. <laughs> so I did a lot more research into it. And there, there, there are a lot of studies um, specifically with a, an ingredient called N-acetylcysteine. So because of that, I ended up starting a company called Preg Prep. And the basis was this N-acetylcysteine that does what I previously explained. <laughs> um, and I basically had a few kits made. I knocked on independent pharmacy doors. I got my, my product into about 20 pharmacies, made a website, um, got a big break, got into CVS, and it kind of spiraled from there. So that, that's how it, how it started. Um, and after that, we had some really good press. I was on Good Morning America, and, it, and a lot of people heard about it. Um, and because a lot of people heard about it, I had a lot of doctors coming to me with their ideas. Um, and a lot of them were excellent ideas. They were incredible and brilliant, but weren't necessarily good marketing ideas. They were ideas that maybe would help 10 people. And, you know, I, I kind of helped anyone that I could, but I wasn't about to be part of that, that product that, that they would come to me with. And then one day, um, a doctor from UCLA, a urologist, um, his name is Dr. Jacob Rafer. He was um, the doctor responsible for most of the research in Viagra, he came to me and said, you know, I have a product, it's a natural product, and it's for erectile dysfunction, and um, it's something you take every day for the rest of your life, and every man in the world can use it, and I thought, that's a good business idea, <laughs> so that's how I started my second company, um, and it's called Revactin, and that's kind of what I've been working on for a while now. I've just launched a third brand, but, um, and it's called Anther. Um, it's a wellness product for men, but that's kind of, you know, I still practice, I practice part-time, but um, I really enjoy having both types of, um, you know, types of different businesses in my life because it keeps it interesting and I love it. So, and I, it's very rewarding, both, both things are rewarding. So that's kind of my long story of how I got here. Hopefully I didn't speak too long, Neil, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. Thanks so much. Uh, let's go to you, Stone, Chris Stone. Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, last night, I actually, a little digression here before I get started. Like for the last 30 years, I've been having this like anxiety dream that like I, like I had an exam the next day <laughs> and I missed it. And I think this is actually pretty common. It actually has a name somewhere and I had the same uh, 
dream last night, in fact, and that I showed up for this at 149. I'm on the West Coast. It's, it's 114 here. And Neil just said, don't even bother. Just <laughs> don't even bother. But I made it. And um, but my own journey is um, I don't know if my lifelong dream was to be a journalist. I do think deep down, though, my lifelong dream was to be able to wake up in the morning and be able to justify just thinking about sports because sports has been part of my everyday life. I can remember back to when I was seven years old reading. My father was in newspapers, reading the newspaper every day and reading the sports section in particular. And that's kind of been my life for the last 44 years. Um, I spent the last, I spent 27 years at Sports Illustrated, uh, the last seven as the managing editor and editor in chief um, before I was let go as part of an ownership change. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, there was an opportunity to move to Los Angeles. And um, I pretty much jumped at it in part because I was looking for something new in my life. I think from, from, a, um, from a personal standpoint, I've lived on the East Coast my entire life. And uh, moving to Los Angeles, a place I visited many times over years, my brother lives here, um, was really attractive to me. I thought it was, a, it was an opportunity for a new adventure, but also the professional opportunity um, was considerable to me as well, um, in large part because I think over the, I think in sports in the 2020s, this is going to be Los Angeles's decade. You know, aside from all of the great professional college franchises we have here, um, the world is real. The sports world is really coming to Los Angeles over the next 10 years. The Super Bowl is going to be here in February. College football national championship is going to be here the following year. The World Cup is going to be here in 2026. The Olympics are going to be here in 2028. And I just like being able to be at the center of that story and helping tell that story. Um, you know, it's, it's a local market, it's a community, but it's also a national and a global community for the next 10 years. So um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been here since last August. I have a family, I, um, my wife, also a Tufts graduate. Um, I have a 19 year old son who's a freshman at Tulane and I have a 16 year old daughter who's uh, a sophomore in high school. And we moved here right in the teeth of pandemic as it was getting progressively worse. I mean, it's almost like I felt like New York was horrible when we were there last spring. It's almost like this COVID storm cloud, a cartoon storm cloud has kind of followed us here. But, you know, we're restored, you know, like the rest of the country, we're getting back to normal. And I'm really excited for this panel and uh, I'll kick it over to Andrew. Yeah. Well, before we go to Andrew, let me just say thank, thank you, Chris, on that. But before I got to tee Andrew up a little bit to <laughs> reinforce my point about how important the people are who you go to school with. Uh, you know, I was 30 years old. I've been working at a dot com that this is the end of that bubble. And we blew all the money and I was out of a job and looked around for something new and reached out to Andrew. And he said, hey, you know, we're we're hiring over here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is a big business uh, lobbying group in town and he ended up hiring me uh, to come work with him and that really changed the course of my career uh, at that point in time and also my personal life I ended up meeting my wife there and and there it is three kids you know two cats a dog and a bird later here I am so uh, thank you Andrew for that and uh, let's hear your personal story. Uh, well, Neil gives me far too much credit for anything he has or hasn't achieved, um, and I won't. I won't take. Uh, I won't take any blame for those of you who want to cast blame his way for anything. Um, but um, so so while while um, so thank you very much for doing this, um, Neil, and pulling this together. Uh, together. Um, while Laura had a very kind of very direct and very organized approach to kind of post college life, and Stone knew he wanted to do something with sports. I had no idea what I wanted to do once I graduated from college. Um, so I came back uh, back to the DC area where I grew up, and and you know just sort of looking for a job. As, as I recall, '91 was an awesome job market. There were jobs everywhere, and people were, you know, people were uh, throwing out offers left and right. So it took me it took me a couple months to find a job, and wound up kind of stumbling into kind of federal policy and lobbying um, as part of that first job, and and I really enjoyed it. So I kind of continued doing it over time, and wound up working, as, as Neil said, for a, a, a large business trade association, the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, worked on international trade issues, then went to a PR firm for a while um, and did kind of uh, DC focused public affairs and public relations, and then wound up going back to a trade association, at which point I, I hired Neil to, to kind of help out with a bunch of stuff that um, that needed to get done. And, and then um, while I was doing that, um, you know, one day Neil and I were, were uh, 
we're in a morning meeting and um, and we were right across the White House. Um, and that day was September 11th. Um, and um, you know, as as kind of things were unfolding in a very negative way in in DC. Um, we looked out my window and saw people just running across Lafayette Park out of the White House. Um, and so we then decided it was time to leave too, because um, we're pretty smart. And, um, and so Neil and I spent the next four hours just walking away from downtown DC. And ultimately, Neil got home um, and I got home. And, and after that, kind of the start of the next chapter of my career, I was kind of, when I came to work the next day, I was told that I was going to figure out what we're going to do in response to September 11th. Um, as, a, as an organization. So I took on that, that, um, that task. Um, and that wound up kind of directing me toward homeland security uh, policy and lobbying works, and which, is, which is what I did for, for the next several years and then wound up meeting one of my business partners now um, who, um, who I helped him grow uh, our lobbying firm now, which uh, grew from three partners um, now to, you know, we're 20, 28 employees. Um, four of them in Seattle and then 24 of them in DC. And so I've spent, you know, the last 15 years building up a lobbying firm um, in Washington. And it's been a lot of fun and it's um, super exciting and super interesting. And, and it's been a heck of a challenge. Building your own business is, is, is quite the, uh, quite the, uh, quite the journey as, as Laura well knows and has talked a little bit about. And, um, and, you know, it's, it's been, it's been fascinating. And as, as Neil mentioned, I think, you know, from my perspective, what I take from Tufts more than anything is, is the network of connections, right? The people that I met at Tufts who I could call and ask questions of, you know, about starting the business or about, you know, specific lines of business we were looking to get in or, you know, finding from other entrepreneurs in this area, benefits brokers in order to, you know, start a healthcare plan for our employees, right? Whatever it was, you know, I used my network of Tufts friends um, to, to help me kind of start out the firm and, and grow it. Um, and kind of getting to the personal side of things. My wife is also a class of 91 grad. Um, my I've got two kids, one is a junior at Georgetown. She started at Tufts, uh, her freshman year, and then, and then decided she wanted to transfer and be closer to home. So she's just finished, as I said, her junior year at Georgetown. And my son, um, was supposed to be at Emory in the fall. Um, but because of the pandemic, um, and because they canceled the soccer season, uh, decided he wasn't going to go to school uh, and, and go to virtual school and not play soccer. So he uh, he is uh, going to be going in the fall and um, and going down to Atlanta. So excited about that um, and looking forward to it. So that is a little bit about my story. Thanks, Andrew. Um, great story that I, I got to be a part of a lot of that. We still see each other quite a bit. We're neighbors now. So that's fantastic. So let me, I want to kind of throw it up to a little conversation, you know, about um, what, you know, your all your expertise and insights into these three really important areas. And it's kind of hard uh, not to have, you know, your initial thoughts in the lens of, of COVID-19 and the, the shutdown on the pandemic and, and all three of you have been kind of front and center on that. So that's where I want to start. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with you, Laura, you know, you, New York city was one of the hardest hit areas in the country with COVID and the shutdown and, um, and you were right there working in healthcare, living there. So give us your thoughts on uh, kind of what you saw and what you did and just any, any personal insights that you might have about that. Well, you know, it was such an unknown when it started. And I feel like because New York was hit first and hard and um, we just had no idea what we were doing. It was, it was really crazy at the beginning. Chris, were you here during that beginning? So, you know, I live, um, a block from the hospital I work at. I work at Lenox Hill Hospital. And there were trailers set up that I can see from my window of refrigerated trailer, trailers for bodies, for dead bodies. Um, and it was, it was a surreal time. It was um, a time that I didn't see coming. I really didn't think it was gonna be that bad. And in the hospital itself, we were, you know, we were all deployed. Um, it was, a learning phase, you know, we every day would talk about what, what do we learn? What should we do? Should we intubate? Should we not intubate? What, what do we think with steroids? Actually, Lennox Hill, I thought did an amazing job. The people in the ICU were really did everything before it was done. Um, they stopped intubating people really early. Um, they used steroids right away. They, they really, really did a good job. But even so it was hundred percent COVID. We didn't do anything else. Um, you know, I had a team of like an OBGYN, a neurologist, and a medical student. And we would, you know, it was it was just a crazy time. But I do feel that um, 
obviously I think we're really coming out of it. I think it was something that we weren't prepared for. I don't, um, I don't think they could have done any, any better than they did. I think there was a learning curve and unfortunately we were the first in the part of that curve. Mm -hmm. so that was yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think one of the good things uh, that comes out of it and, and this, I think it happens in a lot of, you know, traumatic experiences. I mean, no coming out of, wars and things a lot of medical innovation has occurred and i think we saw with the production of these vaccines and in a record time was just amazing so what, what do you think uh, what has been some of the innovation or what are the things you, that we may expect to change in the medical del delivery of medical care you know going forward well i would say one of the one of the biggest things that wasn't really used that much before but now is so prevalent is telemedicine um with my patients, I did only telemedicine. In fact, our um, our offices were closed. No one was allowed into the office. And I think that that's going to be here to stay. I think, um, you know, I was speaking last night with Andrew and I think he's gonna speak a little more about this, that it, it somehow um, in its own way can level the, the playing field. You know, you can have access to a doctor. You can be homebound. You can be in a different state. Um, you could, um, you know, not have the wherewithal to find the doctor you want. I mean, it really, it really is, is a game changer. And um, uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest things for me personally that's come out of COVID mm -hmm. in terms of my everyday life. Is it going to be cheaper and as effective as seeing your doctor in person? It's a great question. I think it is cheaper. I don't know if it's as effective in that I can't get someone's blood pressure. They might have a machine at home. I can't necessarily get an EKG, although now there's some apps that you can do certain EKGs, but I can't do an ultrasound of the heart. I can't do a stress test. I clearly can't put a stent in them. But I think for the in-between visits, it's fine. Um, and some I've had actually had people that went close to their home to get the testing, maybe not in my office or my hospital, but I get, you know, they can send me the CD and I can talk to them on online. So that's been really, really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Andrew, did you want to chime in on that? I know you you were working on that issue. No, I think it's you know as as I mentioned, this is super interesting, right? I mean, and from a from a federal policy perspective, we have a couple of clients that we're working on this on, and I didn't know anything about um, telehealth or remote medicine, distance medicine until until about a year and a half ago or about a year ago when we started dealing with all this, and and it's it's super interesting, right? As as we've been kind of dealing with this, we have uh, and we have a bunch of clients that want to expand telemedicine, right? Or they want to maintain the current you know, cross state line exemptions that exist, right? Where that allow, you know, Laura to practice. And, you know, if I wanted her to see me remotely, I could now, whereas, you know, prior to this, I couldn't. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's kind of a democratizing thing. Um, but in a lot of ways, it also kind of breaks the business model that, you know, folks like Laura have set up um, for their practices. So, you know, from a federal policy perspective, um, there's a, there's a super interesting kind of, um, democratization of healthcare element, that was, that was mentioned, right? That that is that is able to be brought to bear here, while at the same time recognizing that there's some stuff that you're just going to have to go in for, mm -hmm. um, right? And see your doctor. The question for me winds up being, you know, politically, can you make the case that more telemedicine-like stuff can be done to keep people healthier, to kind of remove barriers, to do routine interventions with their doctor routine visits with their doctor and you know and will you know what what will the different lobbying forces line up on that right will the medical american medical association you know line up and say look you know we've got too many doctors that have built practices based on kind of the rules that we understood before the pandemic and we're going to object to any continued uh, relaxation of these cross state line rules um and it's been particularly prevalent i think in the in the in the mental health space Right, where especially mental health practitioners have been able to cross state lines for people, you know, that, you know, kids that are away at college or people that are on travel, whatever it is. So it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch from a, from a federal law policy perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think privacy is also the big, the big issue, right? I mean, yeah. online, can you be hacked? What information are you putting online, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that still needs to be addressed. Um, but why don't we pivot over to, uh, over to Chris and, and talk about a little bit about um, sports, you know, in our culture, I, I mentioned these guys when I was, when we were setting this up, I mean, the first weekend where like all the sports were shut down, I was having a little bit of withdrawal. And the only thing I could find on TV was like a professional bowling tour event, which, uh, I sure watched and it was actually pretty amazing, pretty good stuff. Um, 
But Chris, you know, I think we have learned a lot of learn about ourselves and our culture through sports. Um, again, kind of through COVID and, and having experienced that, you know, the shutdown of our major sports leagues and college ball. So, you know, what did you see um, in this experience over the last year? Um, I think from a, you know, kind of the easy part of last year to understand was like COVID just shut down sports, right? We had a public, uh, you know, we had a public health crisis and the games went away for a long time and then they ultimately came back. Um, but I think just because sports went away, sports stopped, but the world didn't stop. And in fact, what disrupted sports as much as COVID, if not more last summer was like the conversations we were having around social, political, economic, racial issues last summer. And, you know, if you even think about, you know, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of the George Floyd shooting. And that was a front and center issue for sports last summer, because I think increasingly the public with all the tools available, media tools available at their disposal, you know, are looking to kind of our largest in cultural influencers, whether they're athletes, actors, politicians, whatever, like, what do you think of this? And they have the ability to kind of shape the message and the conversation around, around really difficult issues and really difficult questions. And last summer we had not just George Floyd, we had Breonna Taylor, we had the election, obviously, and sports figures, including the biggest names in sports and biggest names in Los Angeles were very much at the center of those conversations. So. You know, sports has always covered these questions, but I think just with the ability to people, you know, all the media options we have and the ability to disseminate information and a message really quickly, the conversation you know, really becomes that much more intense than it's ever been. I was just thinking about this yesterday because there's a sprinter, Lee Evans, who won two gold medals at the 1968 Olympics. And, but he was also part of a um, very famous protest at the 68 Olympics. Um, and back in 1968, it took a while for you, it could have taken somebody weeks to even learn that that protest took place. Now, if this had taken place at the 2021 Olympics, you know, in Tokyo, we would know instantly and the conversation around it would accelerate instantly. And the speed with which people expect us to kind of shape and frame these conversations has changed so much over the years. In addition to the fact that the athletes were covering once upon a time, they needed a place like the LA Times to kind of be their sounding board. But now with all the, the digital and social media tools available to them, they can frame their own message as quickly as they want in the way that they want. And, you know, people say, well, people, you know, people talk about, well, people aren't reading newspapers anymore. They're not engaging with the, the New York Times or Los Angeles Times or Washington Post like they used to. In fact, people are engaging with with media more than they ever have. They just happen to have more choices than they ever had. You know, if you, when we were growing up and they, like I got the Sports Illustrated in 1991, 1992, excuse me. There was no such thing as email in 19, there was, but nobody was using it at that point, let alone Twitter, mobile, social. So, you know, now it's like when we were growing up, like if you lived in, Washington, you know, you got the Washington Post. They had a monopoly on the ability to kind of disseminate information. You had so few choices. If you lived in Cleveland, it was a Cleveland Plain Deal at Boston, Boston Globe, Boston Herald. Now you can find out that stuff from any number of sources, you can find it out freely. Um, but I think the biggest change is like a big, a little bit of a trope in our business right now is like, there's a lot of people who just want to go to sports for sports. You know, there's a stick to sports has become one of these kind of uh, very popular slogans and tropes. Um, but the point is it's impossible to cover sports in 2021 and ignore the rest of the world. Hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating point that I, I wanna I want to stick on and kick it to Andrew, but before I do that, I mean, I do, I want to keep you on the, where journalism is today. You know, it, it has changed so much. I'm much more into the, you know, advocacy journalism and, and the problem there is, is a lot of times the, you, you don't know who the original source was, you know, people post something on social, it looks like a news article, 
but you dig four layers deep and it came from like the Heritage Foundation or something like that. But the end user, the reader doesn't even know that. And so that's, that's a real challenge um, on the like advocacy public relations front, you know, that and, you know, journalists are becoming their own personalities, right? Every journalist has a Twitter feed and they're always interjecting all day long, um, et cetera. So what, you know, what are you seeing and what should we be expecting from the media, you know, as we move forward? Did you hear that? Yeah, he can't unmute mute. himself. I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Stan. Come on, man. It's been a year. What's going on? <laughs> Your first Zoom meeting, huh? There we go. There uh, we I, go. I think somebody needs to unmute me. So <laughs> I kept hitting the unmute button. Apologies. Um, you know, I, I went to journalism school. So in journalism school, and I think it's still taught in journalism school to a large extent, is that you're supposed to be neutral and objective. And I think there's a real kind of almost existential debate that we're having in journalism around this, what, what's called both siderism, right? You know, both sides, it's like, can you, can you be truly neutral and objective? And should you be truly neutral and objective? Because there are, thing, there are plenty of things I think we recognize as being like, why would we offer both sides of this particular argument? White supremacy, for example. Um, and I think the truth is in journalism, I think our biases and point of view have always existed in journalism. You know, the, the New York Times has not, the New York Times isn't so different than the New York Times that we grew up with. You know, I think you could always ascertain what their slant was there. But I do think that journalism, journalists increasingly feel, and I would say not wrongly, that it's impossible to kind of ignore your own moral compasses to kind of ignore your own biases and we can debate like what being on the right side of angels is but you know if you're just going to take hey we have to get both sides of, you know even when you're getting the perspective you know shared by say law enforcement or the defense department for example and there, there's a good example of this recently there was a story in in israel you know which obviously is kind of a flashpoint you know, for a lot of very kind of strong polarizing feelings, you know, throughout the world with, you know, the spokesperson for the Israeli, um, for the Israeli army basically lied and said there, you know, implied that a, um, a ground attack was coming against Gaza. And in fact, he later owned up, well, he mistook it. To, but as journalists, we're kind of taught to kind of say, well, that's, that's an institution that's an official who's telling that this is the truth. And if you print that, well, you're actually printing a falsehood. So we're being asked more as journalists to kind of, we're, you know, to have, allow our point of view to kind of shape a little bit of the way we report things a little bit more. I mean, I think it's impossible to be truly objective. I mean, I think you should always strive for fairness because those are in some ways, those are two different things. You know, fairness does not necessarily equal objectivity and vice versa. And I think that's what you're starting to see in virtually any um, media outlet these days. I can't think of a media outlet out there that anybody with a straight face can say, boy, there's a truly objective, neutral and you know, media entity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think those days are over. So, um, but I, I, to your earlier point, I think people are consuming media in vast quantities. And I think even, you know, print news media or news is, is kind of back. There was a concern, I think, earlier, a few years back that it was from somehow dead, but I think it's been rejuvenated and you get a lot of well, private, private money like Bezos buying the Washington Post and things like that. So I think what's changing that a little bit is the fact that we're going back, the business model of journalism is, of media is changing yeah. a little bit where we're asking people to pay for our journalism to pay for our media, where there was a long period where it was like, it was all free. We were giving away our, yeah. our very best stuff. And now, you know, take newspapers, for example, almost every newspaper insists that you pay for your news. And for a long time that didn't exist. I mean, listen, the Washington Post is a little bit of an outlier in a sense as great ownership, right? ownership that's willing to, in a sense, that's willing to invest in the product and invest in its mm. journalists. One of the things that drew me to the LA Times is that we too are owned by 
um, a single individual as opposed to a hedge fund or a chain who's willing to invest in journalism, to invest in people, you know? You know, I come to a place, I say this to a lot of people, when I chose to come, come to the LA Times, I said, I came to the LA Times because I think the LA Times really has a shot, mm -hmm. you know? And it's a tough, challenging time for media in general, not because people don't want media, but just because it's just so fragmented and there's so many different options, you right. know, for us to consume our media. Right. Well, and with you there, I think it's going to succeed. And now, because I just saw Laura Howell has joined the, the, the program, we have to go to Andrew. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I mean, I, I'm going to go I right mean, to the I'm going to go right to the controversy. I mean, <laughs> first brought up, you know, kneeling, you know, at football games became a litmus test in politics. And, you know, you were either for or against that or honoring the flag. And, and it is a partisan. So let's just get right to it. You know, there was a vote. You know, now we're debating whether we should have a January 6th commission instead of 9-11. So you're on the inside of it. So just kind of give us um, just your thoughts on where we are right now in Washington. Oh, look, I mean, I think I think the two conversations like blend together pretty nicely. Right. I mean, I think I think Chris is exactly right in terms of media being more fragmented than ever before. Um, and what that allows to happen is it allows kind of, you know, um, allows the extremes to gain traction for their particular point of view because they can build their own media outlets and extreme points of view tend to attract more eyeballs and clicks than non-extreme points of view, right? Um, that's just that's just true in our in our business. And 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 um, and as a result, I mean there's no downside to kind of irresponsible, crazy claims on either the left or the right. Um, and so from a political perspective, um, it winds up kind of creating it, it, it kind of it, it, things feed on themselves, right? Um, people on the far left and the far right get praised by media outlets that support their points of view. People fa you know, share on Facebook and other outlets um, things, as as you mentioned earlier, Neil. Right? They they share things that reinforce their own their own biases and their own beliefs. Um, and so you know, so you've got a system now, uh, both politics and media, that's set up to to turn up the heat, not turn it down. And turning down the heat is, is kind of where bipartisanship and compromise exists. Um, and until we get to a place where turning down the heat is rewarded, um, both kind of publicly in media and, you know, privately, kind of politically in terms of, in terms of fundraising and, and kind of generation of revenue and kind of re-election of moderate candidates, you know, things aren't going to change, right? There will continue to be there will continue to be this kind of push for extreme views. And, and, you know, all of this is also fueled by, by the electoral process where, you know, as, as, as especially for members of the house of representatives, right. When they, when um, political parties are choosing their, their elected leaders, um, they, you know, people, people who are kind of in the early stages of those processes tend to be more extreme. People that are more extreme tend to raise more money and to get more attention. Um, and so, you know, you've got a whole host of problems, but again, the whole thing just snowballs on itself. And until there's, until there's money and interest in moderation and thoughtful problem solving, um, it's hard to see things changing dramatically, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to see a um, situation where primaries continue to be very divisive and generate extremist candidates um, that, you know, wind up coming to Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, arguably, I mean, President Biden, I mean, one of the things he ran on, obviously, was sort of bringing bipartisan ba bipartisanship back or lowering the temperature back, kind of what you were saying. Um, I think it was also sort of the COVID co co competency on COVID. That's my, my own personal statement there. But, you know, how's he done um, on that? Yeah, look, I mean, and, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, again, I think that I think in a lot of ways, you know, people, I think everyone, everyone, um, I don't think there's, a, yeah, I, I think that people who who want to see Biden succeed will say he's done a great job and people that want to see Biden fail will say he's done a terrible job, right? Um, and I think all of this is about expectation management, right? And, and it's extraordinarily difficult now to manage expectations um, in a kind of bipartisan, reasonable way, right? Um, I, think, I think you can objectively say, and you know, everything everyone recognized the COVID situation has gotten a ton better in this country, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a lot of that is is due to, you know, 
is due to leadership out of the White House, right? There is, I would argue there is zero doubt about that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it's also fair to say you haven't seen, you know, major bipartisan um, accomplishments. But I think that's also in due in part to the system right now isn't set up to reward bipartisan winning, right? right. Um, and, you know, I work a lot, I work a lot with, the, with the lead Republican uh, member on the September 6th commission bill, a guy named John Katko from upstate New York. Um, and, you know, he, he because he, he's uh, on the Homeland Security Committee and that's kind of where I do a lot of my work. Um, and, you know, we, I, we talked about the, his, his, his bill a couple weeks ago when he was first thinking about doing this. And, you know, it's one of those situations where he is a good example of a person who wants to do the right thing, um, but also recognizes how hard it is. Um, and, you know, I'm also super involved politically in a group called the Problem Solvers, right, which is a bunch of, you know, moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats. That group's getting smaller by the day. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And it's and we, we you know, we should, I think, as a country, want that group to be bigger by the day. I think we should, as a country, want the Biden administration to engage groups like the Problem Solvers Caucus and support what they're doing. Um, but it's hard. Right. Because because if you're the Biden administration, you're getting pushed, you know, by the AOCs of the world and by the Joe Manchins of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And you have to and, you know, but both within the Republican and Democratic parties, they also have to find a middle ground. And them finding middle ground, and then both of them finding a middle ground with each other, it's all really, really challenging right now. Again, because rewarding compromise is not is not in fashion. Yeah, it's just not. Yeah. No, it's, it's funny. I, I went to buy gas today, and there was no line, nothing. And just having read all the, you know, Joe Biden is ruining energy. Joe, you know, cyber attacks, which you know, obviously hyperbole, and, and the federal government doesn't protect private companies from from cyber, but it kind of intersects between the policy and the the media stuff. But I want to get it back to Laura here, give her a chance to come back in, give us, you know, kind of the corporate um, perspective, or you as a as a CEO of a company and a, and a business leader. Um, I mean, you can weave it back into this conversation or how, pol you know, regulatory work or policy or, or just tell us kind of how you are viewing, you know, as you navigate these new waters and you're running these two companies, you know, what are your, you know, what are your plans or where do you, how do you see the future for your two companies? I mean, I don't think that my companies are really affected by COVID specifically, you know, in fact, you know, most of our platform is online. So I think in general, e-commerce has only gotten bigger with, with COVID. Right. Um, you know, I, I think that um, in terms of health companies, um, and I, I know we touched on this last night, there, there are some companies that are based on telemedicine. So they have a doctor that talks to you online and then we'll prescribe a medication. Actually, they're actually pharma companies that hire doctors to, to meet with people and then write a prescription and then they send it. And I think that, that I think needs a certain amount of regulation. <laughs> In yeah. terms of my, you know, little nutraceutical companies, I don't think that it's really, uh, it's not really affected. Yeah. One of the things I've, I've found, uh, especially, and I think Andrew brought up mental health, and I I've, I've have some challenges with one of my kids in this area, but other areas of health, it's hard to find doctors. Now, especially if we're going to open up borders and, you know, state borders and have telemedicine or whatever, I mean, there needs to be, this is my experience in this field, there needs to be some, there isn't like a database where you can go in like an open table or something and say, I want to find this doctor here. Are they available? And are they in my network? And what? So I hope this is your new business idea. I get a little credit. There is ZocDoc. But... Have you heard of ZocDoc? ZocDoc? Yeah. No, what does that do? Where you can go online and find a doctor that you want and make an appointment online with that doctor. I don't know if it crosses state lines, Andrew. I don't know if you know. I think it does actually, because I'm... Um because I use that for all of my doctors, well, not all of my doctors, but several doctors in the DC area. And it's pretty cool, right? And, and you get to rate, rate and review your doctors afterward, um, which I'm guessing from a doctor's perspective, it's a double-edged sword. Um, but well, like you know, Yelp, it's like a Yelp for doctors. It's, it's like a Yelp for doctors. There's a lot of ratings of doctors, a lot of websites that rate doctors, yeah. And people yeah. really read them. People really look at those um, before they see you. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I just think for the, for the medical field, I think there needs to be, I mean, most of my opinion, more sort of transparency or access to information 
I know it's so complicated with insurance and all this other stuff, but as a consumer of yeah. as consumer of medicine, it's such a complicated system to understand and to navigate. Yeah, I can see that it's, it's hard for us. So I, I get that. And you know, at, when you were talking about privacy rules and HIPAA, that's always a big deal as well. So I'm sure Andrew's done a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and you know, especially especially on the kind of on the, just the technology side of things generally, right? Um, privacy being something that you know more and more people want to protect protect more more jealously, but it's easier to it's easy to see it going away. Um, you know, given given how much people give away to social media companies in order to get you know free access to you know Facebook and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, exactly, um, Chris. Back to you. So, what do you? Um... What are the storylines that you're looking looking at for the remainder of the year? I mean, everything's kind of back online and people are coming back in the stadiums and things like that. So what are you all looking at uh, for the balance of the year? Well, there's always the more immediate stuff. Like, you know, we have a lot of great teams in town. You know, last year, we the city won two championships in 16 days, the Lakers and the Dodgers. And it's it is, you know, I think we could expect possibly more of the same uh, this year, but I think it's really more about the fan experience and what it's like with people reconnecting to the experience of being back in ballparks, back in arenas, back on playgrounds like Venice Beach, just playing pickup ball, just being able to go outside and have that, you know, that freedom, you know, the world reopening is kind of like the larger theme that we look at throughout the entire times. And I think that's what we're all looking at in our lives, you know, how like the choices that were taken away from from us for a long period of time have been restored to us and how, you know, it's going to feel strange going back into a stadium or even just being in public in, in a large crowd of people. And I think it's really kind of the reopening of our country that we're really going to sink our teeth into, you know, this summer. You know? Mm -hmm. But don't you think that's got to be great for athletes though, Chris? I mean, you know, for you, if you're a, if you're a kind of a uh, player on any one of these teams, right. Having not had a crowd for months, it's got to be, you know, not not dispiriting, but certainly not super exciting. But all, and all of a sudden, have that crowd noise behind you. It's got to be, it's got to be fantastic, right? Yeah, I'm taking a little bit of a jump here. It's a great point. Um, is that with some, you know, one thing that's been talked about, not just in sports, but across a lot of different cultural spaces, is kind of the mental health toll that the coronavirus is taking on us. And that applies to sports as well and athletes as well. And what you're talking about, just hearing the sound of 2000 people in Staples, which normally holds 18 or 19,000 is like a big deal for these players. Like they need that, they feed off it. You know, they played a season last year in what was effectively an empty high school gym. You know, these empty stadiums. I mean, for the playoffs, you had some people allowed in stadiums for late in baseball and football allowed some people in. But, you know, I just think that, you know, for all of us, I still have not been in an office since February of 2020 or March of 2020, I should say. You know, it's just those, those normal cadences of life being restored to all of us, I think is like kind of the big story more generally. And you can just apply that to sports. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if people go back in full force. I'm, you know, I'm fully vaccinated, but I'm not sure I'm ready to be shoulder to shoulder with uh, eighty thousand uh, people at the. Uh, no, but but the last, watching the Washington football team. Last night, me and my son actually went to a sports bar down the street first. To, like it was the first time we had watched a game together. Uh, we watched the Warriors Lakers game, and it was a great game. Yeah. It was a phenomenal game, but just the whole experience of sharing that with 40 other strangers and just hearing people get excited about sports. We just realized, God, we haven't heard this in so long or felt it in so long. And I could even see it in him, how galvanized he was by it. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we're, so we're winding down a little bit. I did, if you do have questions, you know, throw them in the chat. Um, I, th I think we still have a few more minutes to go. Um, I haven't seen any yet. I hope you felt like you could ask. Um, I have a question well, for Chris. Are your, are your kids really into sports? My son is into it, both as a participant and as a fan. My daughter likes to participate. No, she's a big NBA fan. We're a big NBA household. And, um, you know, they're, we lived in New York for 30 years, and that's where my kids grew up for the most part. So they're they have a lot of New York biases. Actually, me and Laura learned yesterday that our 
we had daughters at the same school for <laughs> four years and didn't even I know it. <laughs> is it this school is this big? <laughs> More, more importantly, Stone, are you covering the Jumbo's men's soccer team? If you don't know, they've won you know, the six national champions. We, we could talk about this a lot, and I think Tufts has done a good job of selling this. Is like It's amazing to me, kind of the pivot that Tufts Sports has made. I think they were okay when we were there. Now they're a national power. I think, if I'm correct, about a dozen national championships over the last decade across a yeah. range of sports, both yeah. men's and women's. That's that makes me want to invest in my alma mater. Yeah, well, I'm sure the development we'll... office is happy to hear that, and we'll be we'll be calling you as soon as this is over. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, and it, no, there was a conscious decision from Tufts to do that because you know some of the other schools, Amherst, Williams, you know they they always invested in their sports programs. And Tufts has done it, and it has been very successful and engaging for uh, for alumni. So um, it is a good point, and we give them kudos for that. I think one thing I'm really disappointed, like not being able to go up to the hill this weekend, is you know I've been up there a handful of times over the last since we graduated, but over the last decades, if my kids have gone, up, it just looks much different than the Tufts we remember, you know, and it and it feels different. You know, you start with the athletic facilities they have. You know, you know, they have new gyms, new indoor track, beautiful lacrosse complex, you know, soccer field is, I guess, maybe the same, but it's nice. There's just been a lot of investment, infrastructure investment, and probably other non-infrastructure investment in the school. That's just always nice to kind of, I'm sorry, we're not there this weekend. Yeah, yeah, me too. We were there. Um, well, the three of us, Laura, I'm not sure you came to the, the 25th reunion, so. We'll expect you at the next it's one. Bring me to the bus. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sorry, we, we missed you. We missed you. Um, so hopefully we'll be there in person. So, all right, last couple of minutes. Um, you know, I kind of asked Stone the forward-looking question. I'll, I'll, I'll give Andrew the same question. You know, forward-looking Washington, uh, whether either through the rest of the year or through the midterms. Um, and then we'll give Laura the last word to, to wrap it up for all of us. Yeah, look, I think, I mean, I don't know, they, I, you can either take a very cynical view and say, look, you know, things aren't going to change. And, you know, we are locked in partisan gridlock um, and, you know, very little is going to is going to change. So, you know, the Biden administration will do what it wants to do and and House Democrats will kind of rubber stamp everything. And and, you know, and Vice President Harris will cast a lot of tie breaking votes um, or you can you can take a more optimistic maybe point of view and say, you know, there's, there's plenty of stuff that you can find a middle ground on. It's just a matter of actually doing the work to find that middle ground. Um, I will strike a more optimistic tone um, and say that, you know, I think that we'll be able to find a, a middle ground on things like infrastructure, um, which is absolutely critical to, to our country, right? Whether it's broadband infrastructure for telehealth or actually improving roads and bridges across the country. Um, I think we'll, we'll find common ground and stuff like that and, and use that as a leaping off point to, to maybe find a little more collegiality and, and, um, and bipartisanship in Washington. Um, I know, I know, I don't know that's the, uh, that's the better bet to make, but, but I'll strike the hopeful tone here today. Oh, great. Thank you. All right, Laura, New York city, healthcare, entrepreneurship, where, where, where are you going? Where are we going? To sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Raising kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would say uh, we're, you know, we're happy where we are. Everything is good. Um, I have to get, you know, kids into college. I'm not, I'm not an empty nester yet. Um, and uh, just kind of keep doing what I'm doing. I don't really have, I'm not planning on a third career, if that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Jabari Dunham Carson from Tufts, uh, who was instrumental on this. Thank you, Jabari. And it's been behind the scenes. Um, and thank you to Laura, Andrew, Chris. I hope you enjoyed uh, this panel as much as I did. It was really fascinating. And um, uh, again, congratulations on everyone's reunion, whatever year you were in. And may we do it in person the next time around. So thanks, thanks Neil, for organizing this as well. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, all. all right. Take care, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.